Welcome to Less's Long Boring Rants. So my long boring boring rant for today is all about Eucharistic prayer A in your prayer book. That's right. Um, you know I've been really struck recently uh, and by the responses to the survey in the church about how much people and how deeply people miss communion. Um, not just by the survey, but also by the conversations I've been having with a lot of people. And, you know, it just strikes me that, I mean, it's interesting, like my heart breaks for the lack of communion. It's a big part of my own spirituality and I haven't been taking it either or celebrating it. In the Episcopal Church, uh, you need at least two people to celebrate communion. Uh, I thought about um, getting my wife to do it with me. <laughs> But uh, I decided, no, that if our, our community is not taking it, I shouldn't take it either, at least until we can again. But, you know, I spoke to one woman and she was talking about how much she just longed to hear the words again. Um, I spoke to another woman and she talked about watching a service online of another priest who at the end took communion like on behalf of everybody. And I, I asked her, I was like, why is it that you how did that feel for you? And she was like, well, at first it felt great. And I was like, and then? And she's like, and then it felt really sad. And if you're wondering why we haven't been celebrating the Eucharist, that right there is why. It's supposed to be a symbol of unity and communion like literal communion, like coming together. Um, the ultimate symbol of the way we have that, at least in this world, um, before the new heavens and the new earth. And in the Episcopal Church, it's such a profound and beautiful thing. Um, and the Eucharistic prayers, the prayers we use for the Eucharist, if you've noticed, they're really long. <laughs> It's like half the service just to pray over this bread and wine. And that's because um, we've organized the prayers in the Episcopal Church to sort of summarize all of Christianity. Um, and there's several different ones in the prayer book. There's A, B, C, and D. Uh, then there's some other supplemental ones too. But I thought today we would take some time with Eucharistic Prayer A. So uh, if you have prayer book handy or if you go to the website, you can see um, uh, prayer A starts on page 361. Uh, and it starts off the way that all the Eucharistic prayers in the prayer book start off with what's called the Sirsum Corda. That's Latin for literally means to lift up your hearts, which might sound familiar. The Lord be with you and also with you. Uh, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to, our, to, to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It begins on this note of lifting our hearts. Um, another word for communion is Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. So this like idea that we're coming bright and up and power in praise of God in this time. And it continues, right? It continues with, it is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Think about that for a second. It is right, good, and joyful all the time to give thanks to God. Um, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Like Father has this like intimate, uh, uh, intimate like um, connotation then followed by Almighty and the creator of heaven. Like all that is, is wrapped in him. Then uh, at the bottom of page 361, uh, it says that there's a, what's called a proper preface. So uh, there's like an extra thing that's stuck in to the Eucharistic prayer that's based on the, just the season of that day. Um, so uh, in this case, we it will pop over. You don't have to look it up, but it's on page 379. So they have words that are part of this Eucharistic prayer just during the season of Easter, um, which is where we're in now. So so the presider would continue. And remember, uh, usually the I've got my hands up like this. It's a position called orons. It's an ancient prayer position. Um, once again, of celebration 
action of lifting our hearts. Um, it's an act of complete and utter joy. Um, oftentimes we celebrate in solemnity, but it is an act of joy. The person who leads the prayers in a Eucharist, the prayer book literally calls a celebrant, um, which I just love. And you could probably tell by the way that I do it. Um, so, but anyway, it continues at least in the season of Easter. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? It's already saying, but like above all other things, we praise you, God, for Jesus's resurrection. This is the only time that like uses that kind of language. Um, for he is the true Paschal lamb. Paschal is a root to like Passover. And there is this story in the Old Testament about the um, blood of a lamb is um, put on people's homes and it saves them from the angel of death. And so uh, for he who are the true Paschal lamb, the lamb that through your blood saves us from death, for who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. Um, sin is such an interesting word in the uh, Christian tradition, and it, it can be really heavy. Um, and I often often refer encourage people to pay attention to whether it's sin or sins, plural, because sins, plural, is all the like bad stuff you do, but sin is meant to be the condition of separation from God. Like we talk about sin, we talk about the nature of being separate from God and all the other sins, plural, come a spin out of our of us being out of the right relationship of God. So when it talks about to put away the sin of the world, it's not just talking about to put away all the bad stuff. It's about treating the cause of the gulf between us and God by his, by his death, by Jesus's death. Uh, he has destroyed death. Isn't that like a beautiful turn of phrase? Um, uh, talking about how, how eternal life uh, comes through Jesus. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. That like sense of triumph even in the resurrection. Um, it's really interesting to find that language um, immersed in the, these prayers Continuing way back on page uh, 362, therefore we praise you. Like because of all of that other stuff <laughs> that we've just covered. Therefore we praise you. Joining our voices with angels and archangels. Archangels are just like super fancy angels, but it's very poetic. Joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name hold on to that language for a second uh, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn we are all singing together with everyone in heaven the angels um uh those who have passed the communion of saints all of us are together in this act in a very mystical way this is the way we understand about communion the cosmic nature of the world comes together in this pure and holy moment of praise to god um, and then we sing this, the, this hymn is often referred to as the Sanctus, um, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. I love to think about that. Like heaven and earth are just like bursting with glory for God. Hosanna in the highest. That means save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. By the way, uh, don't be confused. It's not meant to be talking about us. It's meant to be talking about Jesus. Um, a better translation might even be blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Some of the later versions of the Eucharistic prayer changed it to that, both um, to try to make gender more less important, but also to emphasize the fact that it really is like in context, supposed to be talking about Jesus and not just any one of us. Hosanna in the highest. Then, um, according to the rubrics, oh, rubrics, that's a fun Episcopal word. So rubrics uh, literally comes from the, like the 
root for red brick. In the old prayer books, the like directions were written in red lettering um, as opposed to black. So the directions are a big deal. Uh, and so in the rubric, it says the people stand or kneel, which I think is like really <laughs> interesting because if you look um, at the right one at the old language services there's like contemporary language services a b c and d and then i forgot to mention earlier there's also like old language like these and thighs language um, that's right one there's eucharistic prayer one and two and if you look in the like old language ones it says the people kneel or stand <laughs> And here it says stand or kneel. Um, and trust me, there was a lot of church fights about that. Um, uh, but they ultimately chose that, at least for the contemporary language, to emphasize standing. In the pr in prayer book, whatever they put first is most important. So um, they wanted to they wanted to encourage people not to kneel through the Eucharistic prayer, like most of us do actually at St. Aidan's. Uh, when they were passing this in 1979, they want to encourage people to stand. Um, a lot of people, times in the Episcopal Church, we talk about how we sit to reflect and receive. We kneel to pray and we stand to praise. And if you think about the Eucharistic prayer, it's a, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. So it seems more appropriate to praise even than to like pray in an intercessory way. If you want to kneel, kneel. I'm not stopping you. Most of us do at St. Aidan's, but that's the sort of logic behind the stand or kneel thing. And it continues. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. In your infinite love, you made us for yourself. Um, there's a quote from St. Augustine of Hippo that says, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. Um, that we were made to be with God. It's starting a section of the Eucharist, Eucharistic prayer called Salvation History, where they literally tell the story of the history of our great healing through Jesus. So in the beginning, we're made for uh, to be uh, one with God. Um, and when we had, and then it says, and when we had fallen into sin, and because so when our relationship was broken, um, and become subject to evil and death. Subject, like if you think about it, like a lot of times in the um, Bible and in the prayer book, it talks about the kingdom of heaven. When it's talking about subject to evil and death, it really like means that in a literal way, like a king has a subject. So when we fall into sin, we become citizens not of heaven, but of evil and death. Like that, those things become our king and we are their subjects. So when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death as opposed to subjects of God, um, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, where Christ is anointed, sent to the anointed Jesus. Um, Christ is a title, not a name. It means anointed. Sent your anointed Jesus, your only and eternal son, like, um, once again, it's talking about how Jesus is special and how his relationship with God is eternal. So it doesn't start at the physical birth of the baby Jesus. Like, Jesus is one with God since the very beginning, eternal backwards and forwards, forever and ever. There was no was when he wasn't is what they say in seminary. If that was confusing, there was no was when he wasn't. Um, uh, he has uh, been there forever with God. As long as there is time, uh, since before time itself. Um, okay, so you sent Jesus Christ, your only eternal son, to share our human nature, um, to become just like us. There's an old saying in uh, Christianity that which he has not, that which Jesus has not assumed, he cannot redeem. So the I, so the idea that he like becomes fully human is a big part of our theology, and it's reflected here in the words of the prayer um, over the table. To share our human nature. To live and die as one of us. 
is so simple, right? Like that's so human. We are mortal and so was Jesus to live and die as one of us. Like a very real way to join us in the midst of what it is to have a human life. And then it says to reconcile us to you. So to bring back into right relationship, remember it said earlier that we were created, that we're made for God. And then here it talks about how Jesus reconciles us to God, the, the God and Father of all. It continues talking about Jesus. It says, he stretched out his arms upon the cross that's so poetic. Um, it's kind of a weird way of putting a very brutal reality. But I think it's meant to point to like a retelling of the story with a sense of peace in it. That Jesus gives himself over willingly, which he does. Um, to this brutal uh, death on the cross. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will. Um, he gave himself up. And then it's interesting in obedience to your will. It's interesting how there's like really no way to get around it in the scriptures that while the connection between Jesus and and God the Father, between God the Son and God the Father, is, is so profound as to be without our under, to be beyond our understanding. It is in some ways a mystery, and yet there's no way to get around in the Bible that they do have separate wills, like they do have separate like wants. At least that when Jesus is um, uh, is also fully human, and when he's in the garden and pleading for his life the night before. If there is another way, let it be. And so it becomes important, at least in the words of this prayer, that Jesus offers himself. And he doesn't just offer himself, he offers himself in obedience, like he gives himself over um, to the will of God, um, whatever it comes. And it's interesting because you can sort of think of that as like he did that so he could do it for us, or I think it's better understood as like he did that so we can understand how we do it in our own way. To give up ourself um, in obedience to God's will. And then it continues, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Those of you who've been taking Pam's class have probably heard a lot about sacrifices and temples in the Old Testament. Um, and while... Um, while I don't think it's one-to-one -one in Christian theology, the way that that works, right? Like we don't, uh, we don't have animal sacrifices in the same way or at all. Um, uh, but we do have, but, but we have like held on to the language of like having a sacrifice, um, that something through its death allows us to approach God again. And that becomes complete in Jesus's sacrifice. That's like uh, the book of Hebrews in the Bible is a good place to go if you want to do more about, look into more of that, like that sacrifice once offered. Like for Jesus to offer himself is so big, we never need another one. But interestingly enough, like right here, talking about Jesus's sacrifice, is the reason why you call me a priest and not a pastor or a minister. Um, in the Episcopal Church, in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church, we have a really heavy understanding of what the sacrament is, of like what communion is, and the sense that through that um, uh, a ritual, if you want to call it, or a sacrament, or through that, through those prayers, we actually join in that moment of Jesus's sacrifice. And a priest is someone who performs sacrifices, which is why they talk about the Jewish priests in the Old Testament who literally are sacrificing animals. And it's why these few denominations use the term 
priest because we see what happens on the altar to be a connection to Christ's sacrifice so much that it's as if I'm a part of it in this at this moment at this time when I'm doing it. And so that's why we continue to use the term priests in the Episcopal Roman Catholic and Orthodox tradition. Sometimes people think that it's just a Roman Catholic thing. It's not. It has to do with the way we view communion. That's why we call um, uh, our ministers priests. The prayer book, interestingly enough, can also refer to us as presbyters, which just means elder, um, which a lot of my congregants thought was funny when I was ordained in my 20s. But um, uh, so the lang so there's more than one language there, but um, but that language about priesthood is there for that reason. Um, then uh, the rubrics continue, the directions continue. At the following words, uh, uh, consecrating the bread, the celebrant is to hold it or lay a hand upon it, and the words con and and at the words concerning the cup, to hold or place a hand on the cup and any other vessel containing wine to be consecrated. Now, um, a lot of times people have been asking in the midst of the COVID thing, like, why can't I just like bless your communion in your, like you get bread, you get wine at home and I just do it. Um, this is why it's very clear about making sure I have to touch it. Um, and that might seem weird, except for the fact that you got to remember that our whole theology is wrapped around the idea that God became human, tangible, real, incarnate. And the Eucharistic prayer is about living out that reality, that very tangible, um, incarnate theology. That's why the Rubik say, I have to touch it. And why I, it doesn't count as communion if I don't. I actually don't have to touch the bread. I can just touch like the container, which is kind of weird. But the point of that is like the physical presence actually matters in our tradition, which is one reason why I and the people who died in Texas and pretty much all Episcopal priests, have, uh, Episcopal clergy have been like, no, we're not going to virtually bless communion. Um so once again, it continues on page 362 on the bottom. Um, uh, this next part is um, where they actually tell the story of in the, in the Last Supper when Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body. Um, this is what's called the words of institution because um, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, um, it institute, it creates the institution of this Holy Communion that we keep doing. It's like this command that we keep living out. So uh, on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he, he gave it, he, thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Um, uh, they translated it for the remembrance of me on purpose. It's a little, like, it seems like in English it should be like just to remember me. But um, in the Greek, it's got this like sense of like, not just to remember something that happened, but to bring the past into the present. Um, and that's why it's in remembrance um, uh, and not just to remember. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Um, covenant is like a promise, um, uh, a binding agreement, a contract, but a sacred one. Um, a lot of times uh, in the Old Testament, uh, promises or covenants would be uh, recognized by the sacrifice of an animal. So literally it would be the blood that marked it. Um, so this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. That through um, his death is like is shed for not just you and me, but for many um, and for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this 
for the remembrance of me. Once again, the remembrance and not just to remember, but to bring the past present, which gets back into the whole, like, uh, why we call me a priest and all that sort of stuff. Then I say, therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. And I sort of love that, like, phrase, mystery of faith. Um, uh, faith is not a certainty. It is a mystery. And it is something we step into. Um, and this is the way they say it, at least in uh, Eucharistic Prayer A. Christ has, Christ has died. Christ is risen. It's not just he has risen, but he is risen. He's, lit, he's alive in his risen state. Um, Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again, that he'll come again in person in his fullness to, bring, to usher in a new age. Um, uh, in those three sentences, we talk about what was, what is, and what will come. Um, then it says the celebrant, the person praying the prayer continues. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Um, so death, resurrection, and then ascension is um, Jesus going up to heaven. Um, and in a real way, because he's ascended in heaven, he can be present with us in all places at all times. So remember, not just his death and resurrection, but his death, resurrection, and ascension. I think that's interesting. Um, and that says, sanctify them by your Holy Spirit. This is a essential part of the Eucharistic prayer. It's called the epiclesis. When we call the Holy Spirit to come down on the bread and the wine, sanctify them, the bread and the wine, um, by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. So we talk about the bread and wine being the body and blood of Christ all the time. I also want to point out that the that the other there's other language right here that's treated just as important. Holy food and drink. Holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also. So it's also so you're asking God to like make this stuff special, but then it's also saying sanctify make us special and holy. Sanctify us whole also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament. That in taking it, we don't just take it, but we take it faithfully um, uh, and serve you. Um, so so we take it and then we take it so that we can serve God. And serve him how? In unity, constancy, and peace. Every time I read this prayer, I stop on those. Like, I, I, I read those. Like, unity, constancy, and peace. That we would do it together. That we would do it without breaking. <laughs> and that we would do it with a sense of peace in our heart. And then it continues. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Um, also, once again, looking not just for what was and not just for what is, but what is to come. And it continues, all this we ask that your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Um, it sort of wraps it all up, right? And usually I hold up the bread and wine at that point. The Amen, by the way, is not just, is the only, is in all capital letters in the prayer book. And it's meant to do that because it's, it's actually called the great Amen. And it's so funny because in church, we never, we always are like, Amen. You know, it's like always whispered, right? But it legitimately is meant to be like shouted. Um, uh, Amen means so be it. Um, so it's like a, a, ch a cheer of agreement. Um, it is the ultimate moment of that. And then I usually continue, and then it continues with the Lord's Prayer, um, uh, which is a beautiful thing, right? Uh, uh, Lord's Prayer is a powerful thing and a huge part of all of our worship, but they put it right here in the middle of the, like, well, I, I guess it's technically in sort of like the end of the Eucharistic prayer, but before the breaking of the bread um, uh, to sort of like to rest that prayer in the, in the middle of the Eucharist of making communion together. 
Um, and once again, it's making communion together. A priest can't do it by themselves in the Episcopal Church. That's different in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, priests are expected to perform the Mass every day, or at least they used to be in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and they would do it alone all the time, but we can't do communion unless we do it together. That's actually one of the reasons, too, why um, uh, many people, including our bishop, have pushed back against the idea of like having drive-through communion um, uh, in this COVID time, because uh, it makes it seem like the communion is being made between just the two people, as opposed to the whole community that's gathered. Um, uh, I guess you could say, well, but what's the bread with about that? It's just a communion, a communion, a communion, and one at a time. I don't know. Whatever, you can take it up with your bishop. Or you can ask me and I can send you a really long uh, letter he wrote about it. I think he's got some points, but um, but there is this sense about like, Eucharist is meant to be a reunion. It's meant to be a communion. It's meant to be a coming together of us all. Um, uh, and it's another reason why, in many ways, we've been waiting. Um, uh, rather than doing it halfway, wait till we can do it all the way. Um, uh, we'll see about some of the changes coming forward in the church, but I, I just want you to sort of like understand at least a little bit about where that kind of stuff is coming from. Um, Especially because, you know, there's some churches that are celebrating the Eucharist um, so that you can watch it. I mentioned that before uh, in other dioceses. There's other churches in this diocese where you can log into their Sunday service and they celebrate the Eucharist. And you hear these words and people are law informed. And that's part of the reason why I'm doing this. Um, the reason why I'm not celebrating the Eucharist on camera is because of what I said before about how it could make us feel divided. And because our bishop literally asked us not to. He didn't tell us not to, but he asked us not to for that reason. Um, that communion is meant to be this expression of community together, um, which is, which we are even online, but, um, but, but in an incarnate way, in a, in a like in the flesh kind of way. Um, uh, all of that stuff is baked in <laughs> to the wafer, if you will. Um, sorry, bad reference pun, but, um, all that stuff is meant to come together in the, in, in communion. So then after the Lord's prayer, which I could get into, but maybe that'll be another day, uh, or another long, uh, ramble, what is <laughs> Reverend, <laughs> Reverend Les's long, something rants i can't remember what i'm calling this program um that's a bad sign um and then uh there's a moment of silence uh the priest holds up the eucharist breaks it it's called a fraction the breaking of the bread and then um there's a couple different choices but the most standard one is for the priest to say, Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrifice for us. And have everybody respond, therefore, let us keep the feast, Alleluia. Once again, um, I talked about the Paschal lamb earlier. We're going back to the Passover. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. In Eucharistic Prayer A, there's a lot of like sacrifice and redemption language. That's um, always in all of the prayers, but it's much less emphasized in the other ones. There's some other ways of looking at Jesus's um, life, death, resurrection, and how um, he heals us, uh, other than just thinking about it as a sacrifice. But in the Eucharistic prayer A, they really push that hard, which is one reason why Eucharistic prayer A is usually the one I choose for Lent and Easter, um, because it is very much about this time of sacrament. Uh, of, of sacrifice, excuse me. Um, Eucharistic prayer B talks a lot more about like what it means for Jesus to be incarnate and so uh, and to be born of the Virgin Mary. And so I usually use that in Advent and Christmas. It doesn't. There's nowhere it says you have to do it, but these are the ways that these are the ways that priests think. So anyway, um, uh, getting back to it, all the uh, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. 
um, feast is such an interesting term. Term. Uh, term. Um, communion in our tradition is meant to be a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, which is such a weird thing to think about when it's a little cracker. But it is. It's meant to be like a, a this is an appetizer for the great banquet of heaven. Um, and in fact, uh, when Christianity started, communion was just a potluck. And uh, they would call the Holy Spirit to be present um, on the food. Um, there would be bread and there would be wine and there'd probably be olives and cheese, you know, all the stuff. Um, uh, but the calling of the Holy Spirit, what I called the epiclesis earlier, that was uh, the Eucharist's most primitive form, if you will, like its most basic form. And then all this other stuff grew out over time. They were sort of unintended consequences of the ministry that people were doing and the meaning that they were finding in the midst of the shared meal. Um, uh, yeah, and then uh, I usually hold up the bread and wine and there's some optional words. It says the gifts of God for the people. Well, I guess it's, I'm supposed to say the gifts of God for the people of God. Um, if you think about that, like these are God's gifts and you are God's people. Um, then there's an optional phrase I usually add to, uh, which is in here, which is uh, take them in remembrance. Well, again, in remembrance, not just to remember. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Uh, I love to hit that. You know, our um, our tradition is much more is much less individualistic and much more communal than other expressions of Christianity, especially in America. Like um, Baptists will a lot of times talk about like, what is like your personal relationship with the savior? And for us, it's always communal. It's always communal. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we love communion so much. It's it's our uh, relationship with, not just with God, but our relationship as a community with God and one another, it's all wrapped together. And yet I think there's something to be said for just at least like one moment where it's like, this is about you, <laughs> you know, because it's easy to be like, eh, it's a salvation thing or this teaching thing. It's like, it's easy to sort of like dodge um, if if there's not one moment that isn't like focused. So that's one reason why I like to use that, this phrase. And I like to say it intentionally, that Christ died for you. And then not just stop there, but it says, and feed on him. Like be nourished by Christ and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Remember, what is what does the word Eucharist mean? Thanksgiving. And feed on him, be nourished by Christ in your heart but through faith, by faith, sorry, with thanksgiving. And then there's some words uh, for when we pass out the bread and wine, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Remember, one way of thinking was the body of Christ, but it's also like the bread of heaven, foretaste of the heavenly banquet. Same thing with the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The word salvation, uh, the root of it is healing. Um, the blood of Christ, the cup of healing, um, which is a beautiful thing. Then there's some uh, prayers that we sort of use to wrap up after we've distributed communion uh, and the dismissal. Um, I could teach a whole other lesson on those things, but I just wanted to spend some time with one of our Eucharistic prayers to give a little more depth. Um, if for no other reason than we haven't really heard them in a while, but also um, hopefully you've come, you can come to appreciate them a little bit more. So um, I encourage you to spend some time thinking about what we've talked about today. Like, what is it that popped out for you from these words? Um, what is it that is changed or enriched in uh, how you see this communion thing? Or um, even what is it that maybe you struggle with or disagree with or think is a little whack? Um, and then after sort of thinking about those two things, then it's like, what is it that you want to integrate? What is it you want to take with you? Um, not just when you come to the table uh, to take the body of Christ, but knowing that you have fed 
on Christ in your heart with thanksgiving, like how do you turn yourself into the bread and wine in the world? Um, how are we the body of Christ together? And how does the um, rituals around this and the words around this practice um, inform that and change that for you? And another thing. <laughs>